Turning to um, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 10. We're going to go to um, verse 38 through 42. Pretty familiar set of scripture. Martha and Mary worship and serve. Now it happened as they went they, that he entered a certain village. Jesus did. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. One second, got to figure it out. He entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And he, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Um, And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left you? Uh, Has left me to serve alone? Therefore, let her help me. Therefore, tell her to help me. Sorry. Words are getting jumbled up. And Jesus answered, verse 41, and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Today, um, we start a series, and it's going to be called, uh, we're going to be talking about stress, about the struggle with stress and uh, dealing with stress. Um. If you could, would you pray with me for the Lord to anoint his word, for him to, to visit us and to, to minister us here this morning. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, we praise you and we magnify you here today, Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like your word here today. And Lord, I pray here today as, as teaching goes forth, God, that you'd visit our hearts, you'd visit our mind, God, you'd visit our, our lives, you'd visit our family, you'd visit our emotions, Lord. We want you to change us. We want you to form us and to conform us to how you want us. We want to be Christ-like. We want to walk like you. We want to talk like you. We want to live like you. We want to love like you, Jesus. And help us here today. Teach us the way in which we should walk. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Amen. The struggle with stress. (coughs) Stress is one of life's most prominent emotions. Um, There's this wheel that I used to have in my dorm room, and it helped me with uh, emotional intelligence, and it would, ha- it would be this wheel of emotion, and if I really had trouble um, with emotion a day, I- I'd kind of look at that wheel, and I would kind of point out which one it is. It would, it would have, it'd be a wheel, and it'd be going out, so it'd start with like bad. How do you feel? Do you feel bad? Do you feel happy? Uh, do you feel sad? Do you feel angry? And it'd be a wheel, and it would branch off to more specific, so it'd go bad, and then it'd go tired. And then a sh- uh, branch off it go to stress and it really helped me um, to kind of process emotion and to deal with them and one thing I noticed that was more prominent than any of the others that I dealed with was stress and stress was the most prominent emotion it was one that I'm most familiar with and so here today I don't know if I necessarily <laughs> know how to deal with stress the best but I have an idea that I'm gonna try to shoot off of here today but stress, thank you, Brother Jamie. Need that. <laughs> Do you know that God intends for us to enjoy life? If scripture says that he's, we talk about abundant life that Jesus came to give us, and that's part of what it means we're supposed to enjoy life. There are times of suffering, and there are times of trial, but overall and in general, we're supposed to enjoy life. God never intended for us to live a miserable life. And one thing that so much, uh, so much of the time that gets in the way of us enjoying our lives is stress. I think we've all experienced it. We've all had to deal with circumstances and, uh, that put us under severe pressure, and we don't know how to control the situation. Whenever we are going through such periods of high stress, those are not enjoyable times in life. Those are some times that we don't want to go through. And in fact, it is times when we are feeling not just stressed, but stressed out. I'm sure you've been there, friend. You're not just a little stressed. You're completely stressed out. And that are the most miserable times in our lives. I remember this, this last semester, towards our second to last chapel, I was, I was, I was in the chapel, and I was, I was praying, and I felt a little disengaged with my work. I felt a little disengaged with my schoolwork. And sometimes that just happens, you know. I'm sure you all get it. Sometimes school just sucks. 
and it just it just sucks, and you don't want to do it. And that happens, you know, that happens. And I've dealt with that before. I'm sure everybody has when they've been at school or college or wherever you've been. But this time it was a little bit different. And I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? I feel completely disengaged. I feel disaffected. And uh, Brother Peter Wright, one of my teachers, he was preaching. He was teaching that chapel. And he talked about weary dreamers. And he talked about don't let anything ever come in place of your dream. And I felt that was me. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life? Do you want me to continue here at college? Sorry. <laughs> do you want me to continue here at college? Do you want me to continue to uh, be here? And I felt the Lord tell me, it's time to go home. And at this point, I was like, Lord, you want me to drop out of college and stay home? And he said, yes. And he gave me peace about it. And when stress comes... When a, when, a, when a changing point comes in life, God wants to give us peace about it. And God wants to give us, he's going to give us direction, he's going to give us peace, he's going to give us, he's going to give us peace about a situation because he is the God of peace and he wants peace in your mind. Amen. Everybody's got issues. Everybody seems to be dealing with some kind of stressful situation in their lives. And uh, they're probably envying you because you're not going through what they are going through. And sometimes we envy people because they're not going through what we're going through. So if we as Christians are going to have abundant life, if we're going to enjoy, uh, if we're going to enjoy living our lives the way God intended for us to, we've got to develop in our ability to deal with stress. In Romans twelve eighteen, the Bible says, "If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceable with all, with all men." The implication is clear. A peacemaker can prevent a lot of stress in life if they really work at it. Gypsy Smith, he was um, one of the greatest evangelists in England in the last half of the 19th century. He had the largest congregation in England outside of London, and they met in a building that once housed the Imperial Circus. And one Sunday night, the pre-service prayer group was meeting in a side room used by circus people as a dressing room, and 300 people were in there singing and praying. And all of a sudden, the floor collapsed, sending them sprawling into the stables below. Seventy-five people were injured with broken arms, legs, a few skulls were fractured. All were bruised, but none of life was lost. And the people gathering in the large auditorium heard the loud crash and were terrified, but there was no panic. Doctors were sent for, and the injured were taken home in cabs. But Gypsy Smith got himself, he got himself out of the debris, rushed back up to the platform to where the people, he could address the people back up to the platform to explain the accident and assure the people that all possible help was, has been rendered to the injured. He begged them to keep calm. Some urged him to cancel the service, for though he had no injuries, his nerves were in a state of shock. But he was not alone. When he asked for the lights to be turned up, the nervous caretaker turned them out on accident, and there was a scene of fear and confusion. But there's one. And Mr. Brown, he saved the situation by starting to sing the hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. And the people calmed down and joined him in the hymn. The lights came on and the service went on, but Gypsy Smith was so weakened by the stress of that evening that he had to be carried home. For months after this, he had, he had after effects of fear and trembling, and many years later he wrote, Even now, occasionally, when I am face to face with a large crowd, something of that feeling of that night comes back to me. He, want, he went on to win thousands of people to Christ in England and America, but he never completely escaped the impact of that traumatic event. The point is, just as Christians do not escape the storms of nature, so they do not escape the storms of their human nature. The storms stirred up by stress, the storms stirred up by tension and anxiety. The Christian in this world with a, is in this world with a physical body and nervous system just like everybody else. When it's 99 in the shade, the Christian body sweats. When it's 30 below, the Christian body freezes. When it steps into an elevator shaft, the Christian body falls. And when the Christian feels the friction and grinding gears of a fallen world that will not run smooth, the Christian body and mind records the stress, just like everyone else. We're not exempt from the stresses of life, from the anxiety of life. We experience the same thing some of the people in the world do. And... In Matthew 26, 38, Jesus said to his disciples in Gethsemane, he said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus said that. 
His disciples did not say to him what some Christians have said to others under great stress. Christians never need to be under the circumstances, but can always live above them. And such positive thinkers would have a hard time facing the reality that even the Son of God felt the crushing power of stress. He was already feeling a foretaste of being forsaken by God. And Luke writes in Luke twenty two forty four, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And if we saw a Christian brother or sister sweating with anxiety, we would be appalled by their little faith and would feel compelled to even rebuke them. Even if their sweat was just normal body moisture and not blood. But here he has such stress that blood vessels are broken and blood is mixing with the sweat. And we are talking about a breaking point here. Uh, the human body has limitations as to how much stress it can bear without breaking down and Jesus was on the edge of that limit. It makes sense that he would be for he was facing a trial which makes all other human trials minor in comparison. He was facing the burden of the world. He was facing the burden of sin. He was facing the burden of hell, which is separation from the Father, yet he was innocent. The only man ever to never deserve hell was going to endure it for all those who do deserve it. And we can understand that the cross put stress on Jesus. That was beyond anything we can imagine. But it is a mistake to think Jesus did not feel the stress of normal life as well, for he did. We read in John eleven thirty three 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. The stress of the sad emotions around him was more than he could bear. And then the two verses later comes the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. It is short, but it speaks volumes about the stress of life and what is consistent with Christ's likeness. And we need to start normalizing emotion. I know we don't go by emotion. We go by what we know, not what we feel. But emotion can give a deep self-awareness to who you are. How you react to things. What's your emotional reaction to some events in your life? And honestly, friends, a lot of us here today, including me, we don't even recognize some of those, our, some of our emotional reactions. I read a book, it's called The Anatomy of the Soul. I read it for a psychology class in Urshan. And it says that the way that we handle emotion shapes our communities, it shapes our churches, and it shapes our neighborhoods. Think about it. Let's just say in your family, this is an example, in your family that your mom goes under a lot of stress a lot. Let's just say she's uh, only mom. No father. The way she can deal, deals with that stress is going to shape your home. Because if she deals with stress in a way that's isolating, you're going to be disconnected from your mother most of your life. And so here's this example of emotion. And how we deal with emotion is going to shape our home. And so I ask you here today, whenever you're under stress, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with the crushing pressures of life where do you go for comfort if we always turn to I'll just say if we always turn to entertainment for the, our comfort in stress and high uh, tensing moments that's how we're shaping our homes that's how we're shaping our churches so that whenever we come to church if we're under stress that week if we've had a really bad week we don't really come to God with that emotion instead we kind of wait till we get home and then we we, we do what we want to and we find comfort there and I've done that as, as well and that's why sometimes our church services can be up or down for you it's not that God is not there it's just that some, sometimes mine or, or your lack of emotional intelligence can lead you to think that God's not really here and it's because we haven't given God our emotions and that is such a big point that we have to carry with us whenever we talk about stress, whenever we talk about anxiety, when we talk about tension, the way in which we deal with it and we, and we, we talk about it is so crucial. It's so crucial. And here today we're going to survey that. <coughs> you have two choices. Either stress is not a sin or Jesus was a sinner, for he had stress. And if you're a Bible believer, 
you only have one choice for Jesus was without sin, and yet he had stress. So stress cannot be sinful. The Bible is often a puzzle to us because we try to force a biblical precept into places where it doesn't fit. For example, we see a Christian friend in sorrow and we feel an obligation to cheer them up saying, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. But we forget that the man that said those words was Paul, who felt deep sorrow and wept with a troubled heart over the problems of believers. We forget he also said, Weep with those who weep. And he said also, Rejoice with those who rejoice. We have gotten into our heads that the Christian is not to feel the negative side of life. But friend, whenever you completely tune out the negative emotions in your life, you're also tuning out the good emotions. For the same well in which we draw stress is the same well in which we draw joy. And if you completely tune out one, you're tuning out the other. And this is why we have a situation like Job. He experiences all these negative things. But out of those negative things, he learns the deepness of the good things. We quote our Lord in John 14, 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. But we take this out of context. We take the context of rejoicing in our hope of life forever with Christ in that place where he had gone to prepare for us and try to apply it to the Christian who is distressed over a problem in this life. And by so doing, we are going against the grain of Scripture. The Greek word for trouble is the same word used by Jesus in another place to describe his own emotions. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And John uses the same word, this Greek word for troubled, in another place where it says, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. We take the words of Jesus to not be troubled, which apply to worrying, uh, where, uh, a, which apply to worrying where we will spend eternity and make it say, don't be troubled about anything. But yet that is folly, for Jesus was troubled about plenty. And what all this means is that to be troubled and disturbed because you are full of anxiety about your heavenly destination is to be in a state of disbelief in the promises of Christ and therefore under the impact of sinful stress. On the other hand, if you're working with a boss who is godless and who is just looking for an excuse to fire you, if you try to have a Christian perspective about lifestyle and you have a troubled spirit, this is not sinful anxiety and satanic stress. It is just a normal reaction to life's frustrating pressure. And it's not good to have such stress, just as it was no good for Jesus to have it. But it was not sinful, and it's not sinful for us. The point I'm establishing is, life is full of stress that is not sinful. And there's no need for a Christian to feel guilty for having it. Jesus did the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. But while on earth, he suffered the same stresses and anxieties that trouble us. And this is important to see so that we do not get involved in the foolish effort of trying to persuade us or trying to persuade others that we should never feel the stresses of life. And when we do this, we only add more stress to our lives. For we are trying to do something that even our Lord could not do, to pretend that we can escape the pressures. And it's sinful to think God expects us to be more than Christ-like. God's goal is that we be Christ-like. And in a fallen world, that means being subject to stress that must be manifested in an appropriate manner. And it's nothing but sinful pride that, tries to make a, that makes a Christian try to pretend that they don't feel the normal stresses of our life. Jesus got so exhausted to the point of collapse. He was heartbroken with sinners who rejected him and walked away in the darkness. He was deeply, deeply disturbed by those who troubled him. A Christian who does, not, who does not feel these things is like a Pharisee who stands in the temple and says, I'm glad I'm not like other men. It is sinful not to feel the stress of compassion for the fallenness of man. I'll say that again. It's sinful to not feel the stress of compassion for, fallen, for the fallenness of man. And what I'm saying is that if we don't feel a deep compassion for those who who have walked away with God, I believe that's sinful. For we are going against the grain of the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go out into all the earth. Preach the gospel to every creature, to every person, to all the world. And for us not to feel a deep burden for it, we start going against the grain of the Great Commission. 
it's very important that we feel something. And if we're not careful, we can begin to come numb and we can just go about this sort of ritual. Come to church on Sunday. It's all right. I just come twice a week. Some, uh, and and not, not, not feel a compassion for those who are lost. And we begin to get very, very comfortable. And one thing comfort does more than anything, it numbs. Comfort numbs. So I ask you, friend, what do you do? What do you do? When Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled, he was not saying that we should cease to be caring persons <coughs> and to get our heads so far above the clouds that we can't feel the stress of this world. Jesus came in the world to feel these very things and to taste the depth of the reality of human stress. There's nothing Christ-like at all about escaping from life stress. Jesus sought it, and so did Paul. Paul gave his life to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. And in so doing, he went through every negative emotion and stress we can imagine. And those who preach that the Christian life can be stress-free are preaching a message not found in the Bible. And that finally brings us to our text in Luke 10. In this home in, in Bethany, in Luke 10, 38, we find three of the, of the favorite people in the life of Jesus. And they were all single like himself. It makes it clear that being single is not a stress-free way of living. Yet, no family in the New Testament had to endure more tension than did these lovely trio of singles. Lazarus was sickened to the point of death, and the two sisters were frantic. For they knew Jesus loved him, and they knew he could heal him, but they could not reach Jesus and persuade him to come heal him. You talk about frustration. You talk about anxiety. You talk about super stress. There is more weeping recorded in that house than any in the New Testament. But before this major crisis, we see the minor crisis of our text where it is revealed that they had to deal with the same old pressures of life everyone else had to deal with. The stress of work, cooking, cleaning, entertaining of guests, the tension of different values and goals within the family. And here are the two sisters who are both very loyal in their desire to serve Jesus as their Messiah. But their differences create a scene of stress that we want to examine, and we can see it in two valuable truths about stress. And the first one is, is that some stress is inevitable. Some stress you can't escape. If Jesus could not escape it, if his disciples could not escape it, if his best friends in the world could not escape it, there is something very unrealistic about any Christian who accepts, expects to escape from the stresses of being human. And it's important that we learn how to deal with it, and I've already said that. Even Adam, an ideal man in a paradise, could not escape stress. <clears throat> it was not good for him to be alone, God said, and he felt the stress of lacking companionship. There was stress even before sin. And so we see that stress is inevitable in a world that is anything less than perfect, which is the new paradise in heaven. The good news is, is that if stress was a part of life before sin, there has to be a good side of it. We can, we can see stress as just negative, as something that we feel that is only fueling something negative, or we can see it as so there's a good part of stress. That is, that it had a place in God's plan, for God planned for Adam to begin his life with stress. It motivated Adam to seek for a companion, and it motivated him to do some self-examination of his own feelings. Stress, stress made Adam, Adam want even more from God than a beautiful, wondrous world. It made him want love. And whatever makes us want the highest is good for us. Look again at the stress between Martha and Mary. It grew out of love. Martha so loved Jesus, she would labor the day away to make sure he had the best hospitality a man could enjoy. She was a fanatic for her strong point, which was domestic excellent, excellence. And that was her gift. Her gift was hospitality. And she wanted nothing short of the best for her master. But Mary loved him too. And she showed it by eager listening to the master. And this is why stress is inevitable. Because not everybody has the same gifts. Not everybody has the same talents. Not everybody has the same perspective. Not everybody has the same time schedule. And the only way you can make stress not inevitable is to make everybody carpent copies of each other. 
with no differences. And since God did not choose to create a world of such carbon copy clones, and instead made it so that even two sisters with the same parents, with the same environment, have radically different personalities, stress is inevitable. But remember, it's not all bad. A world where all Martha or all Marys would be a bad world. We need both, and we need both learning from each other and both benefiting from each other. The stress produced here by their differences led Jesus to a point where uh, he needed a, there needed to be a need for balance. And, and we can't expect Martha to become Mary, and we can't expect one sister to be the other. We can't expect them to be exactly each other. If, if we expect them if we expect there to be no stress and for people to always conform to each other's ideas and for one sister to be like the other, we are denying and rejecting Martha's gift and personality and is asking her to stop being herself but be her sister. But Jesus is the author of individuality and not its destroyer. He had no such attention. See, God made us in his image, but yet it seems as if there's so many different images because we are the image of God. We are made in the image of God, and yet all of us aren't the same image. Am I right? We're all very different. All of us have very different talents, different abilities, different um, uh, gifts. And as time goes, we begin to learn what those gifts are. We begin to learn what those talents are. Some people's gift is music. Some people's gift is um, uh, metalworking. Some people's gift is craftsmanship. Some people's gift is um, a discernment. There's also encouraging. There's, there's all sorts of different gifts out there that you can use for the kingdom of God. Hospitality, cooking, cleaning. Such are gifts. Some people can't do it like some other people can. We have gifts. And Martha had let her stress become excessive. And this was making her a problem. Stress was good to a point for it was making her be the best of who she was, but Excessive stress is bringing out the worst in her. Stress is like the oil in your car. It's vital to the engine, but if you overfill it, it becomes a problem. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and so it is with stress. Dr. Hans Seeley is considered to be the world's leading authority on stress. He's written many books and 600 articles on the subject. He says this about stress. Stress is the wear and tear of everyday life. It is a part of everything we do. We can't avoid it, nor would we want to, because the absence of stress is, stress is death. The idea is not to try to avoid stress, but to make sure we live with beneficial stress. He goes on to explain that beneficial stress is basically the proper amount. Martha was not wrong for being under stress, and that is what made her such a great hostess and why Jesus kept coming back to her home for more. He loved it when he could get back there for a home-cooked meal. He would, he, we don't want to knock this lady whose gift gave Jesus a good taste of human pleasure, her problem came because she allowed stress to build so much beyond her level of control. And she cared so much to make this event perfect that she spoiled it. I remember I, uh, my last birthday party. I had uh, a, a lot of friends there, and there is um, one that she chose to host it. She chose to um, uh, completely um, make it and plan it. And she stressed out so much about it that she ruined it for herself, and she had no good time at all. And this is sort of what we're seeing here um, with Martha. And the one most concerned that things be perfect is the one who blots it with imperfection. That is what stress does when it becomes excessive. In proper amounts, it stresses the energy to achieve your goal. But then when it becomes excessive, it becomes the enemy that undermines your goal. Stress is a danger and necessity. For like electricity, it can bless you or burn you. Dr. C.S.I. McMillan was for many years a medical missionary to Africa and later became a college physician in New York. He tells of how he developed the habit of generating $10 worth of adren uh, adrenaline over a 10-cent incident. But one day, a college nurse called him and said, she was sending a girl with a dog at his office. But this dog had a... F it, she sent it to the office because the dog had a fish hook stuck in its ear. And she didn't know how to remove it. 
and Dr. McMillan reacted with lightning-like hostility for his, his head began to pound and he would develop a terrible headache. And here was a man who, who could do such great things with medicine and adrenaline, but yet he was called here to just take a fish hook out of a dog's ear. And he was angry that people would not cooperate with his goals, but he had to deal with these low things and it, 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 was, his, it, was, it was his stress. His overreaction to stress in the reading into this minor request was a major catastrophe of stress management. And him dealing with the stress poorly led to him develop, developing a ulcer, a bleeding ulcer. And he had not learned to deal with stress more wisely. He could have died. And he would have been out of commission in his service for Christ. And like Martha, he cared so much to be useful that he became useless. The more you care, the more likely you will be excessive and allow stress to become a friend turned traitor. Time Magazine did a study of stress and discovered that the highest incident, incidence of stress-related sickness came to people who felt little sense of control in their lives. <coughs> they did not have the power to make things happen like they wanted, and there's, the result was enormous stress. Martha could not control Mary and get her on her uh, bandwagon, and this led to excessive stress. This world is filled with Mar Martha types and Mary types. The Mary types have their own thing, and the result is frustration and stress. And if you wonder why a lot of prayers go unanswered, here's the reason. Notice, Martha said to Jesus and said, Tell Mary to help me. And it sounds more like a command, than, uh, and, and that, that's what prayer can often be if we let it a plea for help. But Jesus did not grant her request, for she was doing what people tend to do under stress. They want to use God to help them to get control over the situation. And Mary is not cooperating with her agenda, and so she is asking the Lord to take her side and help her get, a con get control of Mary. And such prayers are seldom answered, if ever answered, um, because they are a selfish, selfish request to strip others of their freedom of choice. If God answered such prayers, we would all be somebody else's puppet. Jesus rebuked Martha for being so worried and upset about many things, and he said that Mary has made a good choice, and I will not take that which she has chosen away from her to satisfy your need of control. So Jesus thus taught her that some stress is inevitable in a world where nobody can always have their own way, and where others are free to choose their way, but we see also that some stress is not inevitable. Martha did not have to be upset. For she had the same choice as Mary, and she could have made the better choice as well. <coughs> it was not ordained that she be a worry wart, fussing over all little problems. And then she missed the joy of fellowship with her own guest, the Savior, because she was so worried about making things perfect. And this was a choice nobody needed to make. And this is self-induced stress, which is so harmful to life. The fact that some stress is inevitable does not justify preventable stress. And if you remember, Paul said in Romans 12, 18, if possibly, so far as it depends on you, live peaceable with all men. The implication is clear. A peacemaker can prevent a lot of stress in the world if they really work at it. And uh, going back to Dr. Seeley, not only does your Christian life depend on it, but your physical life depends on you being one who prevents stress. In his book, Stress Without Distress, he says the evidence shows that all of us are born with an adequate supply of what he calls adaptation energy. It's enough for a lifetime, but it's a bank account from which you can only withdraw. You can't deposit. So every time you withdraw from your account, you deplete it, and when your reserve is gone, so are you. It's like airplane fuel, he says. It's, it's a, it is expected to be enough to get to your destination, but if you use it excessively by radical climbs and dives, you will run out before you arrive and you will crash. Why do Christians crash and have all kinds of problems like mental breakdowns? One of the primary answers is their choice to cling to stress rather than clinging to trust. In other words, if a Christian pilot tries to fly over a 120-gallon uh, mountain range with only 100 gallons of fuel, he'll crash. We can all agree that's a fuelless decision, but it's what many Christians do when they go beyond their capacity and take on more stress than they can control. 
People with a Martha complex who have to have everything perfect. And everyone under the control will have a highly li- more highly uh, likelihood of a heart attack. Our lack of emotional processing leads to more physical issues. And this is so true. You see it with people who can't deal with anxiety well. People who can't deal with stress well. Like we read about the, the doctor who didn't want to take this hook out of a, 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 out of a dog's ear. He was so stressed about it and saw it, uh, saw it as so pointless that he ended up developing an ulcer, a bleeding ulcer in his head because of the lack of emotional processing. And you might see this as kind of like uh, out of left field, this fact that emo- uh, our lack of dealing with emotions can um, lead to physical issues, but they can. Our lack of self-awareness can lead to, to physical issues. Mary was living in the same stressful world as Martha, but she was spending her quota of adaptation energy moderately. Martha was a spendthrift and was depleting her resources rapidly. And Jesus was teaching it is not necessary to handle stress like Martha. We can choose to handle it like Mary and live the balanced life where some stress is not inevitable, but some stress is inevitable. We can prevent it, avoid it, and eliminate it. Stress brought Jesus to the breaking point. And if you are bearing the sin of the world, you have the right to a breaking point. But if you were getting bent, all over, bent out of shape over a meal or, or a fish hook in a dog's ear or 1,000 other trivial things in life, you are mismanaging your stress, friends. And I'm coming to a close. I want to read this scripture in Psalm 34, uh, 19. A righteous man has many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Though there's a lot of problems in this life, the Lord delivers you from all, and he gives peace about them. Even the greatest, most stressful things in the world, a Christian can manage them. You can be leading a a, a billionaire business and be able to deal with it excellently because you have the Holy Spirit. And because you have wisdom and you have knowledge and you have, you have a power from on high that gives you authority and it gives you, it gives you strength for such stressful situations that someone who doesn't have the Holy Ghost can't manage. God does not promise escape from stress, but he does promise to help you manage stress so you can take advantage of its positive side and control its negative side. And may God help us to be good stress managers in this stress-filled world. Would you stand with me here today? And I believe God wants us to be able to deal with our emotions in a healthy way. Some people, when they're angry, 